Hello everyone! When you suspect a urinary tract infection, you will order a urinalysis to look for signs of bacteria and leukocytes in urine. You need to detect both to diagnose a UTI with a decent level of certainty. So the question is, how reliable are our diagnostic tests in detecting bacteria and leukocytes? The most widely used diagnostic tools are urine test strips or so-called dipsticks. Now, urine test strips cannot detect bacteria directly, but certain species of bacteria turn urinary nitrates into nitrites, and that we can detect. However, there are a few limitations you should be aware of. Number one, not all bacteria produce nitrites. E. coli, by far the most common cause of community-acquired UTIs, does produce nitrites, so do Klebsiella pneumoniae and Proteus mirabilis, but for example, the second most common cause of community-acquired UTIs, Staphylococcus saprophyticus, doesn't produce nitrites. Many hospital-acquired bacteria like Pseudomonas or Acinetobacter don't produce nitrites, so this makes nitrites somewhat less reliable. On top of that, bacteria need enough time to produce enough nitrites for us to be able to detect them. This is one of the reasons why we always want to analyze the first morning urine. However, of course, this is not always possible, so at least we want to make sure that our patient hasn't urinated for at least four hours, because again, bacteria need time to multiply, to incubate in the bladder, to produce enough nitrites. Of course, in practice, this is easier said than done. Imagine a patient with very bad dysuria and urgency who has to rush to the toilet every 15 minutes, not to mention that people with urinary tract infections often drink a lot of fluids. All of this results in dilute urine with a very low concentration of bacteria and a low concentration of nitrites. Also, if nitrites are negative, but your patient's symptoms strongly suggest a urinary tract infection, check the acidity of this urine sample glucose concentration and protein concentration, because very low pH can cause a false negative nitrate test. So can very high glycosuria, like in unregulated diabetes, and proteinuria, for example, in kidney disease. If nitrites are positive, this is very specific. You can be quite certain that there is a significant number of bacteria in that urine sample. Just make sure that the test strips have been properly stored and not exposed to air for a very long time, because this can result in a false positive nitrate test. So much about nitrites. In the context of UTIs, in addition to nitrites, we always look for leukocyte esterase, an enzyme that is found in leukocytes, of course. But please keep in mind that Leukocyturia does not necessarily mean that this is a urinary tract infection, especially if there is no concomitant bacteriuria. So if you find positive leukocyte esterase, but negative nitrites and no other signs of bacteriuria, be very careful because there are many causes of leukocyturia that don't have anything to do with urinary tract infection. For example, sample contamination with leukocytes is actually very common. Or if your patient has already started taking antibiotics, this may be the reason why there are leukocytes but no bacteria in the sample. There are also more serious causes of leukocyturia without bacteriuria, like STDs, tumors, kidney stones, renal disease, even a powerful inflammatory response within the abdominal cavity like appendicitis or diverticulitis can result in leukocyturia without bacteriuria. So once again, if you find signs of leukocytes in urine, but no bacteria, be very careful. In addition to leukocyte esterase and nitrites, you may even find signs of hemorrhage, meaning hemoglobin, because infection and inflammation damages the epithelium in the urinary bladder, and this produces hemorrhage, and this you can detect in the urine sample. Okay, so much about test strips. In addition to that, if you have a lab, you can detect leukocytes and bacteria with more direct methods. You can use an automated analyzer, hemocytometry, or microscopy of a centrifuged urine sediment. In urine sediment microscopy, we use the cutoff of 2 to 5 cells per high power field, and in hemocytometry, it's 10 cells per microliter. And all the pitfalls that I mentioned when discussing test strips still apply here, but I would like to add one more. In severely dehydrated oliguric patients, you will often find leukocyturia with no inflammation, no infection whatsoever. 
This is a very common finding in clinical practice in hospitals. With microscopy, you can also detect bacteriuria, but if you want to know exactly what kind of bacteria, what species you're dealing with, and what kind of antibiotics they are susceptible to, you will have to order a urine culture. Now, the main problem with urinalysis is always contamination. This is because in routine clinical practice, there is no reliable method to obtain a perfect uncontaminated urine sample. Now sure, you could insert a needle through your patient's abdominal wall straight into the bladder, but since we do have the Hippocratic Oath, which tells us to first do no harm, and our patients have lawyers, this method is rarely used. Instead, we do it the natural way. We have our patient urinate into a sterile cup. But this approach, of course, is likely to produce a contaminated sample. Research suggests that up to 30% of samples are contaminated with leukocytes and bacteria. This is because the stream of urine has to pass through the entire urethra, including its outermost portion, which is often contaminated with leukocytes, bacteria, mucus, epithelial cells, everything. So how do we get around that? Well, there are several methods that we can use to reduce the possibility of contamination. Number one, we always instruct our patients to retract their foreskin or spread the labia and then clean the orifice of the urethra with a sterile swab. Then we tell them to discard the first stream of urine that is supposed to flush the contaminants from the outer portion of the urethra. Then we tell them to urinate once again so that we can catch this clean midstream sample of urine. Now, truth to be told, none of these methods have ever been proven to work, but even in this modern era of evidence-based medicine, sometimes we simply do things that intuitively make sense. And all of this seems reasonable. But in practice, all sorts of things can go wrong. To illustrate my point, imagine an 80-year-old nearsighted patient with osteoarthritis and a crutch, or maybe hearing impairment and dementia. She is instructed to provide a sample and then sent to a toilet that looks like this because the hospital hasn't been renewed in 60 years. There is no one there to assist her because there is a chronic shortage of staff. How likely is it that she is going to provide an uncontaminated sample? It's even more difficult with immobile patients, nursing home residents, patients with urinary incontinence, adult diapers, maybe even indwelling catheters. There is no way they can provide an uncontaminated sample. So many times you will have to obtain a sample via a urinary catheter. But please keep in mind that you should never use the old indwelling catheter because it's bound to be colonized with all sorts of bacteria. And just because these bacteria stick to the catheter, this doesn't mean that they also cause your patient's UTI. So always insert a new clean sterile catheter and then take the sample. Okay, let's suppose that you got the sample somehow and you happen to detect bacteria in that sample. How do you know? Is this true bacteriuria or mere contamination? Well, if you find epithelial cells in the urine sample, this means that the urine was in contact with the genital mucosa. In other words, it was probably contaminated. Also, if you find several different species of bacteria within the same sample, again, this was probably contaminated because in a true UTI, only one species of bacteria will cause the symptoms. Now, regarding the number of bacteria, as a general rule, in true bacteriuria, the number, the concentration of bacteria should be way higher than in contamination. And this makes sense because in bacteriuria, the bacteria have the time to incubate, to multiply in the bladder and reach very high numbers. As opposed to this, if it's just contamination, the urine will pass through the urethra and simply carry the few bacteria that happen to stick to its outermost portion. This will end up in the sample, but they don't have the time to multiply before the sample is analyzed and that's that. The question is, of course, how high does this concentration of bacteria have to be for us to say that this is true bacteriuria instead of contamination? Well, the threshold was defined way back in the 1950s. If your patient's urine sample has more than 100,000 bacteria or so-called colony forming units per milliliter, this represents true bacteriuria. If the number is lower than that, this is probably contamination.
In some clinical settings, if the risk of contamination is lower, or if we are simply less concerned about contamination because our patient's symptoms strongly suggest a urinary tract infection, we will use lower thresholds. For example, if the sample was obtained through a clean urinary catheter, the risk of contamination is relatively low. In males, due to the anatomical structure of their urethra, again, the risk of contamination is considerably lower. In young, premenopausal, non-pregnant women with the typical symptoms of cystitis, we will use lower thresholds because the symptoms are so highly characteristic and we are less concerned about contamination than about missing the diagnosis of a urinary tract infection. If you think that all of this seems a little bit counterintuitive, you are right. I wanted to illustrate how difficult it can be to tell the difference between true bacteriuria or true infection and contamination in practice. If you want to know about exact thresholds for significant bacteriuria, I highly suggest you take a look at your local guidelines because there can be differences between different guidelines issued by different expert groups. And okay, let's suppose that you did find a very high concentration of bacteria only one species, right? And you did find a lot of leukocytes and you are finally ready to declare that this is a urinary tract infection. Not so fast. What are your patient's symptoms? Because if your patient has no symptoms of a urinary tract infection, no fever, no dysuria, no flank pain, no urgency, nothing, this is still not a UTI. Asymptomatic bacteriuria is very common and it's increasingly common with increasing age. So in elderly nursing home residents, in patients with adult diapers, in patients with indwelling urinary catheters, it's extremely common. And asymptomatic bacteriuria should not be treated with antibiotics, except in some very well-defined circumstances, like in pregnant women and patients who are about to undergo a surgery that will involve the urinary tract. On top of asymptomatic bacteriuria, there is the problem of possible contamination. You remember the 30% from the beginning, right? And you've seen how difficult it can be to tell the difference between contamination and true infection. Many doctors are confused about the thresholds for significant bacteriuria and how can you blame them. When you put all of this together, it's no surprise that unnecessary or misinterpreted urinalysis is one of the main drivers of unnecessary treatment with antibiotics, even broad spectrum antibiotics. And this is a huge problem because we all order unnecessary routine urinalysis from time to time, don't we? You all know what I mean. Every patient who gets admitted to our ward has to have their urine checked or we are about to order a million blood tests, so why not urinalysis too, right? Someone will see leukocytes or bacteria or who knows what in that urine and they will think, you know, better safe than sorry, there are bacteria there, we should probably start antibiotics. And more often than not, this is wrong. If your patient has no symptoms of a urinary tract infection, this is not a urinary tract infection. Urinalysis is so common, so widely used, that we often underestimate the level of knowledge that is necessary to interpret it well. Of course, it can be extremely helpful, but if taken out of context, it can actually do more harm than good. If you feel like you learned something useful today, please stop for a minute and think, who else might benefit from this information? Who else uses urinalysis on daily basis? We all do. It shouldn't be too hard to come up with a couple of names, right? Thank you for watching. Good luck out there and take care.